In a moment, I'm going to hand you over to Nick Byrne, who is the director of the LSE Language Centre. Nick came to the LSE in 1998? 1999. 1999. 1st of January. And when he arrived, um, the LSE Language Centre was a very different place from the way it is today. I understand it was on the verge of being closed down entirely and the services being outsourced. So Nick has come along and breathed vitality and life into, uh, into the centre. And we're now a very sort of healthy and vibrant centre and very much a part of the university. With regard to the incessional programmes, um, such as they were, I think there were just a few workshops really that students had to pay for, um, which were provided by hourly paid teachers. One of the very first things that Nick did was to um, departmentalise them, to introduce um, that system, and that's something that we've continued with and continue to try and um, strengthen. He's also been very helpful in terms of um, making sure that we now have a full-time permanent body of staff in English, and he's changed the funding of our programme so that it's uh, free at the point of use. He's going to be retiring at the end of this month. Oh, and we're all going to miss him incredibly. <laughs> so I'd like to say... <laughs> so I'd like to say, take this opportunity to say thank you to Nick for everything he's done for us. And to give him um, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Alison. I'm giggling. I'm sad. Giggles. Schizophrenic approach. Um, but it, it is really... This is my last formal event. Um, I had an event yesterday called Reading the City 2. Reading the City 1 was in New York, you know, as it <laughs> can be, at uh, Columbia. In fact, it, it's, it's about multilingualism in the city. And it, um, it's, it's one of the brilliant things that we've done with the Language Centre at LSE and our colleagues. Um, they're trying to be inventive and to really make sure that everybody who works in the language centre has access to funds and money to go places to make their ideas come true and to really sort of facilitate what they do whatever field that they're working in um, somebody actually said well yeah what you're doing is really all these events are just like a retirement party for you with a theme <laughs> attached to it you know um, so I have to remember there is a serious reason why you're here I'm also realizing having been to so many conferences I've, I've worked in higher education for 25 26 years um, the job before was at um, what is now the University of the Arts London then it was called rather glumly the London Institute that people didn't really know whether it was an asylum well, you know, um, um, or what. Um, or people used to say to me, the London Institute of what? And I thought, yeah, yes, that's true, a good title. Um, but I've been at, at, at um, the LSE for 17 years, um, and it has been an amazing time. Um, one, of, one of the things that it always worries when you have the introductory, and this is not a PowerPoint, presentation is the bit where you always like at the beginning of a conference I feel there is the good Nick and there's the evil Nick you know, it's me <laughs> and the good Nick is going like oh do tell me about the structure of the language centre at the LSE I'm really interested in that oh funding and the other bit is going like oh I can look at this at the website why are you telling this now just get on to the main act Ursula. but I will try just to paint a little picture because I think it's interesting we all live in interesting times and um, all of us have had to go through funding changes, management changes, organisational changes and I actually think that the EAP world has actually been affected more than the MFL world um, or the modern languages world um, and I think that all of you, no matter what institute you're working in, no matter what structure you're working in, really do deserve the biggest round of applause. Because I think all of you, no matter what it's turned out to be, have shown consummate professionalism, a commitment to your studies, what you do, your, how you deliver, to your students and to your colleagues as well. You have get, kept your shows on the road through incredibly difficult times. And I actually think, cheesy though it is, I'd like to give you a round of applause for doing it. Thank you very much. Um, at, at LSE, we're a mixed unit. 
um, we're a, a language centre and um, we have a varied brief. It's a bit like spinning plates. Um, I think it's very much like the academic side. So in that I'd put those areas where we actually deliver something as part of a degree. And you can do language, French, Russian, German, Spanish, literature, five literature courses. We've introduced sociolinguistics. And you can do that for 25% of your degree. And that's a really good thing to have if you're a mixed unit because you get the funding there. The other plate I'm spinning is support. And that, of course, is our whole in-sessional programmes, how we support international students. And, hey, if you can't support international students at LSE, mm, what are we doing? You know, 70% plus of postgraduates non-UK, 30% for undergraduate non, um, are, are non-UK. But the split is 4,000 undergraduate, 6,000 postgraduate. So you can see where we're going with this. It's absolutely vital. The team I've got here, we built up of 10.11 actually, people are crucial. And yes, one of the things I did, we need full time, we need permanent. Gone must be the days of bits and pieces. Thing. It has to be free on the point of delivery. And for me, if I actually claim to have any sort of specialism, it's in languages for specific purposes. Um, I did a keynote at Manchester last year, and if you scratch Google, something will come up. But the one thing I've always found it was fascinating, that I think languages for specific purposes are having a moment again, and people are reassessing after going down the route in the 90s, slightly debunking it, all the counter-arguments and counter arguments And now it's actually part and parcel. Things we know don't have to be either or. If you're blending learning and you're blending teaching, you can blend loads and loads of ways of deliveries and pedagogical approaches. And I think that's the room we're in. And if anything, the other thing, if you Google me, you'll get, what is he talking about now? Flexilingualism. And the idea of, of flexilingualism, not as opposed to plural multilingualism, that what I'm interested in are in societal changes, financial changes, how these changes influence how you structure things. It can be sometimes what the students want, it can be what the institute needs, it can be what the overall mood of the of our market is, but we have to be flexible. And the idea of flexilingualism, you know, we've seen over the last eight years, owing to the economic crisis, the biggest shift of south to north migration that you've seen. People didn't particularly want to learn Danish, Dutch, or the Netherlands if they'd been working in France or Italy, um, southern or, or uh, Spain, but you do. And people didn't think that they'd be learning Chinese for business, Mandarin but they have to. Um, the whole question in Germany, Germany in particular, I went to um, a, a meeting in January where on the topic was um, providing German language support to uh, migrants, um, so German as a foreign language. And of course, what was fascinating is that is a huge growth area, not in terms of the hardcore we can make money, but simply the university language centres in Germany have had to mobilise all their teams, turn <laughs> non-German teachers into German as a foreign language teachers, because they're having to provide it for the whole cities and towns. We've not had to do that in, in many ways, and I'd be very interested to see. So what we're doing, you know, we're having to react in many ways. We can have our hardcore centre of EAP, but if you're working in a language centre or working in other areas, these are interesting times. Again, the other sort of plates, I've mentioned the service one, providing language courses at low cost to the community. If we've got 400 people doing languages or literature as part of the degree, we've got 1,500 registrations for English language support in sessional. We have about 1,500 people doing a language at another time, um, uh, uh, outside <coughs> of their degree. We do income generation, foundation programs, executive programs, anything that you can market that has executive in front. <laughs> One of the things that is important apart from bringing in money so you can show your institution, we are capable of bringing money. And some of you have got a far more onerous task than we have. I know some of you are really working so much with international recruitment 
that the link between you and doing that, the pressure that must be on that I'm very, very lucky that we don't have that is enormous. But it just you know, how core what you do. And these these things interlink. Um, the other thing that we're very pleased about is applied research. There's a big thing, particularly in mainland Europe, about mm -hmm. the importance of research. Um, you know, is it recognised? What is the subtle difference we have, or not really so subtle difference, between applied research and, um, if you like, referable type research? Now, if you are doing English in an institute of or school of education, you're probably having an easier time easier time, question mark, question mark, getting your research done or it being recognised. If you're in a language centre, it's one of our weaker points. It's we're Often we're told, um, you're a language centre or you're a centre, you know, uh, let the big boys and girls do the research. But I think that's changing. And I think having events like this, the way Bali does and the most amazing job, and I really do, um, I mean, the way you've done the website, the way you really carry things to the limit, your accreditation schemes, I think are, I'm very, very interested in the way you have professionalised, professionalised, and I can't think of the verb, but turn academic into a verb, and I can't pronounce it at the moment, and I need some water. <laughs> well, whatever you've done with that verb, that has actually been amazing as well. And I think that that route to making sure that the research that we do is relevant, but we can actually show and demonstrate far more easily than other subjects the impact of our research. And I think that is a very interesting strand for you to look at, how you can really visualise, explain the impact that you have. I mean, it shouldn't be that difficult, but it needs to be done. And the final thing that we do in our language centre is outreach, outreach with community, outreach with schools. So those are the sort of six plates that we're working on. <clears throat> if you add all those numbers together, we teach 4,000 students plus, which is 40% of the total of LSE, which is quite a big task. We do that with um, a management that really understands what we need and we've also been able to do it because I have an amazing team of colleagues without which this couldn't happen. Um, the dedication, the enthusiasm, the sense of fun um, has been incredible and I think there's nobody in the director's management team that does not recognise the strength of my colleagues in the language centre and I'm very, very grateful that we have got that support from the top. LSE is a strange institution, it's a bit dysfunctional, um, it um, does have a character, characteristics that are a bit eccentric, but it does care, and as I say, that I'm very grateful to have had 17 years here as well. My final points would be simply to say that whatever situation you find yourselves in, nobody should underestimate the importance that you have to the institution. Sometimes you are the difference between students coming in the first steps because of marketing and indeed in terms of recruitment. But once they're here, and this is where we come to today, that's where you make the difference of whether they stay, of whether they can complete their degrees, complete their studies, and perhaps even more important, whether they're happy or not. So thank you very much for all your work. Thank you. I've not introduced Ursula because this is happening now. Hello, so good morning, everybody. My name is Gemma Stansfield. I'm a coordinating language teacher in EAP here at LSE. And uh, this morning, I'm delighted to introduce our plenary speaker, Dr. Ursula Wingate. Um, Dr. Wingate is Senior Lecturer in Language Education at King's College London and Convener of the Forum in Academic Language and Literacy. One of her main interests is researching the theoretical and pedagogical models underpinning academic literacy instruction. And in recent projects, she's developed various approaches to teaching academic literacy in mainstream higher education. This morning, Dr. Wingate will share her research with us in her presentation, Embedding Academic Literacy in the Curriculum, 
the role of EAP specialists. Following the presentation, we will have approximately 10 minutes for questions. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Ursula Winger. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gemma, and thank you very much to the conference organizers for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here and speak to you today. Um, the objective of my talk is to consider how the expertise of EAP specialists could be so well, so effectively used within academic departments and to the benefit of all students. The focus of this conference is on in-sessional provision. In my view, this provision could be considerably strengthened if it was restructured in a way that would facilitate the attachment of EAP specialists to academic departments and a much closer, and to facilitate a much closer collaboration with academics in these departments. <coughs> to understand these proposals, uh, or the proposals I want to make today, it is necessary, oh, this is somehow um, flicking on, it is necessary to look more closely at the concept of academic literacy. And this is what I want to do first. So in the first part of my talk, I want to um, discuss a common lack of understanding of academic literacy as a learning need for all, of all students. And I want to explain why EAP provision on its own is not sufficient to develop students' academic literacy. Next, I will consider the benefits of collaboration between subject lecturers and EAP specialists. Um, and I will give a couple of examples of collaborative approaches. And lastly, I will discuss how curriculum embedded academic literacy instruction can be best achieved with um, extensive input by EAP specialists. So I'm coming to part one and the question, what is academic literacy? So I understand academic literacy. First of all, we need to say very clearly, it is much more than academic writing. Um, academic literacy means communicative competence in a specific academic discourse community. And this includes reading, reasoning, presenting, debating, and of course, academic writing. For these communicative actions, these are, uh, communicative actions are underpinned by students' knowledge of um, the, how communication works in a discipline namely their knowledge of the discipline's epistemology, <coughs> so how knowledge is constructed, debated, and, pre and presented, and of the genres in which the discourse community interacts. Now, what is, it's a pompous word, academic discourse community. For graduate students or a young, or an academic, this means the discipline. Um, which in, in itself is quite an unstable concept. For an undergraduate student, it is the very study program in which they have to interact and learn to communicate. It is obvious from my um, definition, from the, this definition of academic literacy, that all students in a study program need to acquire it. And uh, therefore, I would always avoid the distinction between native speaker and non-native speaker of English. Uh, it is also obvious that academic literacy can only be acquired within the academic discourse community, not outside in a, in a center. However, academic literacy is hardly ever, is rarely explicitly explained or taught at university where the instructional focus is entirely on academic writing. Students, most students somehow manage to pick it up but uh, some don't, but all students could do better with more explicit advice and support. So the current misconceptions of, um, common misconceptions of academic literacy are that the label is commonly, commonly used for academic writing only. So many universities advertise in their websites um, academic literacy courses or support when in fact they do language work, generic language work, and uh, academic writing support. Um, 
There is also a misconception about the problems that students have with academic literacy and all the communicative actions that belong to it. Because students' problems are often perceived as English language problems only. Hence, the specific target of, uh, on, uh, non, or of non-native speakers of English. There is this kind of deficiency view that those deficient, um, I mean, those who don't speak English as their native language are uh, <laughs> regarded as deficient from the beginning, um, and fr frequently uh, problems uh, occurring around academic literacy are attributed to them and their lack of proficiency in English. Therefore, we have this kind of um, public discourse of student deficiency, and those of you who read the Times Higher Education Supplement regularly will come across these frequent um, uh, complaints um, and articles where lecturers bemoan, I quote, appalling writing skills or the sad loss of literacy in contemporary universities. This um, a kind of blame culture demonstrates a lack of understanding of the deeper problems that surround student writing and it also demonstrates that lecturers are only able to pinpoint those surface features that have to do with language. So th these misconceptions result in an insufficient teaching provision at universities. So at almost all Anglophone universities around the world, we have two main instructional provisions, which is EAP and um, a kind of study skill learning uh, ad advice provision. These are typically, uh, these, this, these courses or programs are typically offered in central service units, whatever their name is, learning center, English language center, often it's an attachment to the library. I'm not um, criticizing those two approaches, which are very, very useful in helping students with their language problems, um, with um, problems uh, of, uh, of um, acclimatization to university, sorry. Um, but what I'm criticizing here is that uh, at the moment, they represent the only support available for students at university. Um, for the development of academic literacy, um, these approaches have severe shortcomings. One is the fact that English is taught generically. Um, uh, and generic, EAP typically offers courses for students from all disciplines, which um, is helpful to a certain extent. but. Let's face it, language there is detached from academic content, from subject content, and therefore we can only that teach a kind of universal, I would say non-existing universal English. Um, the focus can only be on features like grammar structure or some features of rhetoric. Um, and this is certainly useful for an in induction of students to Western higher education and for remedying language problems. But it is unhelpful for the understanding of the discipline-specific requirements, conventions, and genres. Secondly, at the moment, EAP programs are mostly targeted at so-called international students. So that, and many, mo on most websites, of EAP centers, we can see that the provision is for international students only. Now, we have to overcome this fallacy of the non-native speaker, native speaker, international student, home student. When we think that in London, I think some 60 plus percent of home students are, come from non-English speaking backgrounds, we really have to overcome this distinction. Um, and it is totally unfair not gi to give other students access to this kind of language, um, a language provision. Lastly, um, what is a short, the shortcoming is the inadequate um, attribution of responsibilities for students' academic literacy development. So the resp respons responsibility is delegated to kind of service units, um, which are lower in the university hierarchy. Um, uh, when in fact the subject lecturers are the experts in their discipline's literacy. 
In the current system, subject lecturers are not obliged to engage with the development of academic literacy. And although many do, intuitively or less <coughs> or explicitly, there is no entitlement there is no system for students. There is no systematic approach. Um, however, uh, my feeling is from interviews I've done and um, recent publications I've read that the majority of university subject lecturers don't see their role as helping, in, in, um, helping students to, in, in this area and anything to do with language. So subject lecturers typically have misconceptions about students' literacy needs. They blame everything that goes wrong to language problems. They are uncomfortable with teaching anything to do with language. Um, typical quote, I'm not an, an English language teacher, and in relation to the English Language Centre, you do your English, we do our subject. Um, the <laughs> subject lectures are also often not capable of teaching um, anything to do with the disciplines, discourses, genres, and so on, because, because they themselves have been socialised implicitly, they have learned it um, uh, on the way, but have not learned to teach anything to do with the language um, in, uh, used in their discipline. And lastly, um, they believe anyway that students should learn writing before they come to university, writing. Um, so a quote from an interview study that I've done with Jenny Jenkins is, I'm a law lecturer, I'm quite happy to help as far as I can, but you know I'm not an English support teacher, support much lower, of course. And I'm not trained to help people who really need specific targeted support, nor are any of my colleagues. Um, so this we got to hear um, quite often. Now, to look, to, oh, I want to strengthen further my argument that um, academic literacy needs to be taught within the literacy. And to do this, I want to look more closely um, at what is involved in academic writing. Now, the literacy actions involved in writing an, an assignment is that, of course, subject knowledge is needed and an understanding of the way of presenting knowledge in the discipline. Um, then, as all university writing is evidence-based, um, students need to do a literature search and be able to identify relevant sources. They have to evaluate information from these sources um, and see what's relevant for their argument and then synthesize this information into their developing argument. Um, lastly, then, they have to present their argument in a logical, coherent manner. Um, so writing is really the end product of a very complex and difficult um, process. Now, the knowledge and actions de described here in points one and four are intrinsic, intrinsically linked to the academic subject. And advice on these steps can only be given by an insider, by, by the subject lecturer, for instance. And it's well known how much students um, struggle with the reading aspects of, of their assignments. On this list, highlighted in red, I think it is point five, really, where the EAP um, specialist would come in with the presentation of knowledge. But in the, for the first four steps, um, the subject lecturer needs to be involved or in charge of the instruction. Now, I'm talking about the need for discipline-specific support, help, and instruction. Now I want to look at what is really available in the disciplines at the moment. Which discipline-specific support do students actually receive? So very typically, they receive uh, writing guidelines online or in program handbooks, some handed out in induction workshops. Um, I know this very well <coughs> because I'm doing it myself every year. And the other second provision, which is potentially very powerful, <coughs> is feedback on written assignments. So this is the most individualized kind of literacy instruction that students can be given, but they don't recognize it as such, mainly because the feedback doesn't make sense to them, as I will show you in a moment. 
So I give you examples here from writing guidelines. From a um, undergraduate law program in the handbook, it, it says that students have to apply appropriate legal English, construct clear legal arguments, and evince sound legal reasoning. Mm -hmm. From our own program, I'm ashamed to say, um, uh, it, it, there it says, you will be expected to approach critically the ideas about which you have read. Now, if students freak out when they hear the word critical, that puzzles them most. Unfortunately, this is never explained to them. So there is a, it's, it's a circular thing, really. Um, students have no idea what is meant by sound legal reasoning. So um, this kind of advice is pretty useless. <clears throat> and as Lillis and Turner have said, um, these con the expected, the requirements, are communicated as, as if they were common sense and transparent. Nothing is transparent to students about I in these statements. Let's look at feedback. Now, I have a little corpus of um, lecture feedback on <laughs> within, from kings, <laughs> from, from some disciplines. And I've really um, noticed how much needs to be done in that area. So you did not answer the question. This is not relevant. Your arguments, I like that one, but it doesn't make much sense to the students. Your argument tend, arguments tend <coughs> to get buried in the rather shapeless text structure. Now, just to give you, I have done interviews with students when they have received their feedback to discuss it with them. And here's a little extract. So we're not at the moment using powerful, potentially powerful methods of helping our students um, delivering, uh, developing academic literacy, then these opportunities are not used. So what is needed in, for, for in, in academic literacy instruction? First of all, um, we need staff development um, around the university. We need to make subject lecturers aware of, stu of students' learning needs. Um, for example, of all the literacy, uh, literacy actions involved in writing an assignment, we need to also make them aware that um, current support provision is not sufficient, that they can't just send any problem to the English Language Center, because that's not what the English Language Center is about. Um, and we need to show them <coughs> ways um, in which they can develop students' academic literacy as part of their regular subject teaching and assessment. Because for instance, if this feedback was done properly, we would um, have already a much improved um, situation. Curriculum integration. Um, this means that academic literacy instruction should not only be discipline specific, but it should be a regular part of subject teaching. So that would include all students in a study program and separate, the, uh, and, and, and uh, sorry, um, abolish the um, current separation between literacy language on the one side and subject knowledge on the other side. Um, so, but for all this, for, for, for staff development and for the integration of um, academic literacy support in the curriculum, in my view, the EAP specialist is very much in need because subject <coughs> lecturers cannot do this kind of stuff on their own and it needs the language specialist, uh, a language specialist to advise them and guide them with this. And uh, as I'll show you next, there is in some universities, in some countries, a movement towards curriculum integration and co collaboration. And this is coming to my part two now. I see that I'm running out of time. Um, so I look at types of collaboration and levels of integration, give you one example from Australia and some examples from our own work at King's College London. Now, you all know this well-known model by Dudley Evans and St. John, who describe three levels of collaboration between EAP lecturers and subject lecturers. One is that the EAP specialist gathered, gathers materials from the discipline and prepares teaching materials. 
and then delivers uh, specific sessions to the students. The second one is a joint preparation of teaching materials and teaching uh, to, to prepare teaching sessions, which are still delivered by the um, EAP specialist. And the highest level is team teaching. Now, this is a nice model, but it, it is an EAP model that doesn't work for academic literacy because the responsibility here is still entirely on the EAP specialist. And what we need, we need to shift that. We need to move in the disciplines and make the EAP person the one who contributes and the subject lecturer the one who delivers. Now, here you see different levels of integration. That the first one is where we are now. So all provision of language support, literacy support, if it is that, is outside the department, delivered by EAP specialists, and there's very little, if no, uh, collaboration. This is Dudley, Evans, and St. John's, so their timetabled workshop, um, de probably designated teaching sessions, but run usually by the EAP specialist and maybe some subject lecturer contribution. Where we want to go is to integrate academic literacy um, support as a credit-bearing timetable into the subject teaching, um, where it is an assessed part of the module, delivered by the subject lecturers in uh, cooperation with EAP specialists on input and advice of EAP specialists. That would be, I think, the ideal way to, um, de to develop students' academic literacy. Um, now, I show you the Australian uh, example because they have achieved this more or less. In Australia, um, starting from an initiative in the University of Wollongong in the 1990s, um, where the co here they're called all staff, academic language and learning staff, moved into the dif disciplines um, and uh, started collaborating closely with subject lecturers there. This has spread all over universities, most, uh, all over Australian universities. Most of them are doing it, and it is now part of the um, higher education national policy in Australia. Uh, a little bit more about this uh, model. So the aims are to help teachers across the disciplines to recognize the linguistic nature of academic learning and teaching, <laughs> to make specific changes in teaching and learning practices so that student learning is better understood by the subject lecturers. And involving the <coughs> learning developer, in this case I'm talking about EAP specialists, in more than the teaching of writing and the subject lecturer in more than the teaching of their subject content. I have to say this is happening um, increasingly in uh, South African universities. There are examples in this country as well. For instance, Middlesex University are taking this approach as well and moving into the disciplines. Um, however, there are questions. When you read the um, related publications, uh, you notice that there is no clear uh, account of what is the actual teach, what's actually happening then in the classrooms. <laughs> we don't know uh, what kind of theories underpin their work. Um, how does actually this collaboration work? So there are many questions remain open and for the practitioner this is difficult because what are we actually going to do once we start collaborating with people in disciplines? And to um, clarify some of these questions or make some uh, more specific recommendations. We've done some work at King's College London um, with a writing intervention. There are some people here in the room who have been part of that when they were in our MA uh, course, uh, our a MA program. Mm -hmm. So we got funding um, to d do an intervention to develop, this was unfortunately very much still focused on writing, discipline-specific writing resources in which we clearly draw on <coughs> ESP and uh, systemic function linguistics, the Sydney School, um, because I'm absolutely committed to genre approaches to academic literacy instruction, because genre analysis, in my view, is, the, is most capable of helping students understand the way of communication 
um, in, in their uh, discourse community. And we also wanted to tease out a little bit what we could do, how would the work with subject lecturers go. So we got funding to work in four disciplines. Applied linguistics is ours, so um, this was the pilot in a way. And we had um, a kind of mates in pharmacy, history, and management, people who were enthusiastic to work with us. We had funding to give them a little bit of money because enthusiasm, enthusiasm wears out very quickly with subject <laughs> lectures. <laughs> and even with the kind of incentive they got, uh, it needed a lot of chasing up. Um, so um, what I should say is also we used student genres. We uh, collect corpora of student writing, previous student writing, and look, use them for the development of materials. So has someone shown the sign already? Five minutes? No? Mm -hmm. Five <laughs> minutes, okay. <laughs> I'm aware of the time. Um, so what did we do? Um, we used a collection of student text, which in our own discipline, we, we called it the King's Apprentice Writing Corpus. Um, it hasn't <coughs> grown, unfortunately, beyond applied linguistics. Um, but in the other disciplines, we asked the subject lecturers to give us um, <coughs> a representative set of high and low uh, achieving student texts. We did then, we call ourselves, Chris Triple and myself, the EAP specialist, uh, an analysis of the exemplar text, identified the discourse features, what is good and not so good about these texts, and in consultation with the subject lecturers, developed a pack of materials, which we used in academic writing workshops in these disciplines, um, which were jointly delivered by us, the ERP specialist and the subject lecturers. I have to say here that the workshops were always, although not obligatory, um, attended by 70 plus percent of the student cohort. So do you see what kind of need there is? So um, what we did in our materials um, pack, we had three high scoring text examples with commentary. So our commentary runs like a move analysis and says what <coughs> makes comments, what's, what's going on in the text. Um, then follows one high scoring text where students have to provide a comment a note section, and then, and this is what is really needed because students love it, two low-scoring <laughs> examples. And they, that comparison is very, very helpful for them. So um, one who is sitting in this group was uh, attending a workshop two weeks ago <laughs> in applied linguistics. We do then, we run three-hour workshops where students work entirely in groups and discuss what's going on. Um, the learning effects are actually quite substantially, we have done evaluation by um, recording, audio recording the group discussions, looking at changes students made in their own text because they bring sometimes their own text and discuss them. And um, so this is a successful approach. I show you very briefly how this works. So um, this is a, a, was an initial workshop on how to write introductions and conclusions. Here is a high scoring assignment. And, we, and like in a MOVE analysis, we describe what's going on. And there are several examples. The students discuss, so obviously, in an introduction has this kind of order. Obviously, you have to establish the background first and so on. And so uh, uh, this is only a tiny extract, but it does work well. Now, a shocking example from pharmacy. <laughs> we had a real struggle to prepare these materials. Um, this is the very beginning of the um, pack, and students look here at the structure of a high-achieving lab report, 75%, and a low-achieving one. And in the discussion, they understand <laughs> what we don't understand. They find out that uh, how, what a tight and appropriate structure looks like and what, what a structure should be not look like. i just show you this as an example that we haven't just worked in applied linguistics, which is a bit easier for us. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the limitations, of course, the focus is still far too much on writing. Um, uh, it is curriculum linked, so the middle column instead of curriculum integrated, and collaboration is difficult, even if you give them money. Now, <laughs> um, if we want to move from 
the current insertional provision where we know that students are often too hard pressed to be able to participate or to receive in session report. We want to move to a curriculum embedded instructional model. What is needed? First of all, institutional commitment and investment, which we haven't got. <laughs> um, so because staff, um, academic staff needs staff development measures and incentives to do this kind of work, and this costs money. And then we would, I think, need the integration of EAP specialists into faculties and academic departments in the same way as it's happening in Australia. That also would cost money because it's, of course, cheaper to run a centre than sending people, attaching people to the disciplines. Um, I just need to see how many more slides I have. I think very few. Yeah, so staff development, I think I have already... Um, said that earlier is needed to show people ways of integrate. First of all, to raise subject lecturers awareness of the need and show them ways how to integrate um, literacy support into their regular teaching. I have elsewhere proposed methods of uh, embedding literacy instruction and here I want to just highlight how important the AP specialist would be to make this work and I have only time for few examples, but for instance, um, you, you will have the slides so you can read this more carefully, maybe later if you are interested. Um, the EAP specialist uh, would be very helpful, for instance, in helping online discussions on readings and commenting and advising on reading problems or um, helping to prepare specific resources within the discipline, with the specific assignments that students have to write, which could be offered in follow, which could be dealt with in follow-up tutorials. Um, the ERP specialist would be probably the best person to help academic lecturers to formulate their feedback in a way that it is really formative and constructive for students. Um, so just a few ideas where I think the help of the EAP specialist would be indispensable. Final thoughts. I was just uh, shown the one minute sign. So, are structural uh, changes and investment of, into resources, mainly human resources, likely? I don't think so at the moment. Because for you know, senior management, first of all, don't understand the background to academic literacy. <coughs> they um, are very aware that remedial, the, current remedial provision is much, much cheaper. And also, as I found out <laughs> um, acutely recently again, they want quick fixes for students. Um, what I'm proposing would take years, really, of staff development and, and restructuring <coughs> and so on. It doesn't necessarily show immediate um, results. But I think we should be optimistic. We should think, keep working at bottom-up initiatives. Um, I've just done one at King's, um, started one at King's, where I introduced a module on developing students' academic literacy in our PGCLP, which is the um, uh, certificate in academic practice that all young lecturers have to do. So that is a good way to raise this awareness. Uh, but ESAP staff can also continue to work, and I'm sure a lot of this work is going on to reach out into departments, seek affiliations, specialize into certain disciplines, and so on. And I, I think um, this is the way forward. Thank you very much. <laughs> Yeah, there's one hand. Uh, we have a microphone coming for the questions. Thank, thank you very much indeed. This was very, very interesting and um, very encouraging. I have a feeling in this room there are probably quite a lot of people um, who are on similar wavelengths. 
just thinking of your table with, with three different uh, types of uh, provision, the extracurricular, the integrated, uh, and, and the uh, linked in, in the middle, isn't it? I wonder if we might actually just ask the audience how many people have got which of those happening already, because I know we've got all of them. Um, and so uh, I suspect that that's probably true uh, in, this, in this audience. So I'm not really up to date, really. Uh, I know that a lot of work is, is going on. Uh, I think probably should push more to the, towards the right column to, to really integrate uh, literacy instruction into um, the disciplines. But if this work is being done, not much is published about it. So this yeah. is why, why I wouldn't yeah. know necessarily. I hear when I go to conferences that a lot of work is going on, and it's great. If we want to grab the attention of senior management and, and make progress, I think we have to write about it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I'm sorry, I didn't want to be dis disrespectful at all of the work that is already being done. Yes, yeah. Uh, uh, thank you, Ursula. Very, very, very interesting talk. Yeah. Um, you gave us a, a short uh, outline of the way that you exploit the materials. Um, can, can you give us just a flavour of the theory of learning underneath that exploitation of the materials? Yeah, this is constructivist learning, isn't it? They, we, we use basically the um, Sydney School's learning and teaching cycle, where you start with text deconstruction, this is what students do when they analyze the work with the materials text. The next step is a joint construction. And um, we, in some workshops, we ask students to bring their own text. So they're writing an assignment. We, we, we time this fairly carefully. And we're working on introductions and conclusions. So after they worked with the materials pack, we ask them to bring an electronic version of their assignment. and work on each other's introductions. And we, to evaluate um, our teaching, we take um, track changes. So we look at the changes students make to their own text. The last um, phase in this cycle would be independent construction. So they go home and apply what they've learned in our workshops to their own um, work. So it is constructivist learning that underpins it. I'm very interested in the, um, one of the final points that you made, the intervention in the PG cap and other sorts of... Sorry, um, oh, sorry yes, I'm, I'm interested in the final point, um, yeah. which is the, the sort of teacher training um, aspect. And uh, I'm just wondering if you can say more about how, how that works at, at yeah. King's, um, yeah. what sort of workshops you do and, and yeah. how they're received by the, um, yeah. the lecturers. Yeah, we, um, I ran it for the first time in the winter term, 2015-16. Um, it wasn't well advertised. I, I first of all, I had to push um, the King's Learning Institute to get in there, <laughs> get a foot in there, um, then develop the module. It wasn't very well advertised. We had only six participants, but they really loved it. So I did um, five three-hour sessions with them, and their assignment, so I, I it was quite theoretical as well, giving them genre theory and so on, but also discussing practical approaches. They, they had to analyze practices in their department. That was their first assignment, which was discussed online. And as their final assignment, they had to develop an, any kind of intervention to improve things. And the work was ac actually wonderful. So one has uh, developed a reading program uh, for <laughs> undergraduates. Another one has uh, developed an online um, academic writing program and so on. So it was really uh, wonderful. Uh, but I can't make big claims, of course, because I had six participants. And yeah, it's, it's all very, very bottom up. But I think uh, this should be more widely taken up. <laughs> I can't see anybody. <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, very useful, and I couldn't agree more with your points about the need for publication and for the senior management to know about what we're doing in the mm. world and the value. Um, one thing I think language centres sometimes forget, or, or and some use, is the internal funding available in the institution. 
there's lots of um, learning and teaching and he's still luckily and I think if people can um, apply to that within their institutions that's often a good source of funding Yes. Uh, and then do one initiative working with the discipline that can kind of demonstrate the value um, I think the writer can take years and these investments at the top but I think there are ways of doing one specific thing which can bring publicity mm. Yeah. Which is really, really useful. And then yeah. That more yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's an excellent idea. This learning and teaching funding yeah. that's not being cut. It's not being cut. And the important thing is to do an initiative and budget into your funding application dissemination around uh, your university. I think that's a very <coughs> good uh, good idea. Yeah. <laughs> Very much an interesting presentation as everybody said. Um, probably more of a practical question overall. I wonder we certainly uh, uh, can find that some of the schools are engaging in this and deliver their own types of courses without the EAP specialists there. Um, one of the struggles that, that they've encountered is that their degrees are already very full. They already have 120 credits. They, because of the accreditation for law or for business, they're already very full in terms of their delivery and their time. I wondered whether that had been an issue you'd encountered, and if so, how you'd got around that. Mm. Yeah, I think not much extra would uh, would be needed to be uh, would have to be added to the curriculum if there was proper integration. Yeah. And I'm, for instance, in my list of what could be done in the classroom, I suggested these literacy windows, and I've, I've tried that often. I uh, tried that out in my lectures. So when you make a point or you present a point of knowledge, it's very easy to show very briefly, flag up how this is debated in the literature and make students aware of something and, and refer them to text, you know, make this link to language. It is, would be so good if people would just pay more attention to the way they give feedback to students. So um, I'm not ne necessarily talking about additions, but integration. There was another question somewhere. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm impressed with the University of Winchester. Uh, we've had a little bit of experience in this area in terms of uh, linking and, and embedding. And we've managed to uh, get from bottom up approaches from within our unit language unit building, uh, linking with individual academics to try and some of these things you're saying. Certainly in Column 1 on your and Matilda. And we've had a go actually at uh, embedding and collaborating in terms of trying to get into the cur curriculum, sorry, and, uh, and produced uh, module outlines for academics to come on and so on. Even though we've developed this in paper, we have resistance to uh, academics taking this up. And you'll get a yes at the beginning, and when they explore it with a spinner, Belong, it's no, it's too much hassle for them. So it gets kicked back, even though we develop these things. So I do, I do agree. There are the walls and there are difficulties, and we've got to get senior management to buy in to a certain extent, or at least at the faculty level. And uh, but we put a lot of effort in, and, and we've run into quite a few walls. So we can reach the region at this stage. And I agree with you. It's got to be bottom up, and it's going to take a lot of years. Mm. So there's some. Experience Thank you very much. Can I just say something about when, while I'm talking to you? I find out that a lot is being done in individual institutions. Now, we could do something together now um, and really making more people aware of it. If I was allowed to, <laughs> to write to the conference participants an email saying, could you please give me um, some uh, insight in what you're doing? This could be easily written up as a kind of survey paper, then to be, you know, disseminated and also disseminated to senior management. So if you, if you don't mind, I will write to you in, in the next few months and ask you to give me some insight in what you're doing, <coughs> if it, possibly following up with you. I think that would uh, really push things forward. Good. I got your, con <laughs> your, your consent. <laughs> Thank you very much.